Welcome to the fourth lecture on uh, topology and condensed matter physics course. Uh, we have been talking about uh, discrete symmetries and uh, how these symmetries actually are uh, responsible for uh, the topological phases of matter. And um, if uh, you actually uh, destroy one of the symmetries, then uh, the system may not remain topological or may uh, make a transition from one topological state to a trivial state or a topological state to another topological state, uh, which will happen via, uh, you know, the gap closing uh, of the energy spectra of the Hamiltonian. Okay. So, uh, while uh, we were discussing uh, the discrete symmetries uh, and uh, we have uh, talked about uh, uh, these uh, time reversal symmetry, which has been, you know, discussed um, in the previous day and uh, we have done it for both uh, spinless systems that is the Hamiltonian does not uh, explicitly involve uh, spin. Uh, or uh, even in the case when it does uh, explicitly involve spin because if uh, particularly if the system has uh, uh, this spin orbit coupling then you need to uh, take into account spin uh, spin degrees of freedom else it can be considered as spin polarized which uh, are both the cases we will see uh, over uh, as we progress through uh, the course. All right. So, uh, now uh, since we have done this time reversal symmetry, uh, the one that is remaining, um, a few of them are remaining, uh, we will now talk about the inversion symmetry. Uh, this is also called as parity. So, what is an inversion symmetry? If you change x to minus x or r to minus r, um, then that is called as inversion symmetry. I mean r to minus r, uh, what I mean is that, uh, so the vector r goes to minus r. That means the, uh, the magnitude r remains same, uh, theta changes by certain angle and phi changes by certain angle and that is what is called as a parity uh, operation. Uh, this you might have uh, learned when you uh, did hydrogen atom and um, or the angular momentum. Uh, so, in fact, uh, you wanted to know that uh, what are the uh, sort of uh, inversion symmetry or parity of the uh, spherical harmonics and the spherical harmonics actually pick up a minus 1 whole to the power L uh, under uh, parity transformation. So, this is like minus 1 whole to the power L y L m. So, this theta phi and uh, so this is equal to theta plus phi and uh, phi minus, uh, uh, so it is probably minus here or plus here. Uh, anyway, this can be uh, settled if you uh, look at uh, the relevant uh, discussions uh, in hydrogen atom. Here we are talking about uh, discrete symmetries that is uh, uh, under these transformation, the let us talk about this uh, parity uh, or the inversion symmetry operators by a pi. Uh, I stands for inversion and P stands for uh, parity. Uh, why I am writing both the uh, with a subscript is that uh, we will also use the particle hole symmetry uh, with P. That is why I am just writing it with a PI. So, a, if you have a PI acting on uh, you know R and a PI, so this is a dagger then this becomes equal to minus R. So, R is the position operator. So, this is the uh, definition of that. So, in a simple case, uh, you know, p i could be uh, just a matrix like minus 1, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 0 and 0, 0, minus 1, which inverts uh, all the r to my or the x to minus x, y to minus y and so on. Okay. So, uh, if you write it like that, then uh, p i r now, these are unitary operators which means that uh, uh, u u dagger equal to 1. So, p i dagger equal to 1. So, this becomes equal to minus uh, r p uh, i and so on. So, what I do is that I uh, write multiply it by um, uh, the p i dagger uh, on both sides and uh, the p i p i dagger becomes equal to 1. <laughs> And that tells you that uh, I mean this or uh, what you can do is that you can also uh, write a left multiply by P. Let us just do that instead of uh, this step. So, 
I will write it. Uh, so, left operate by P i and that will become R P i uh, because P i P i dagger will become equal to 1 and uh, minus uh, P i R and uh, so that tells you that uh, they anti commute because R P i plus P i R equal to 0 and hence they anti commute. So, P i and R anti commute ok and um, uh, what happens to uh, the momentum variable in fact uh, uh, we uh, mostly talk about the position variable momentum variable and uh, if it concerns spin now of course parity uh, has got nothing to do with spin so it will leave it unchanged so this is for the uh, real space uh, operator r and uh, for the momentum operator uh, p uh, it uh, has a very similar thing because p is nothing but uh, dr dt which means that it is uh, proportional to the velocity multiplied by the mass. So, this will uh, also give rise to this p i uh, then p uh, and then p i equal to minus p okay and uh, so the p is the momentum operator and then again you we have these p i and p that anti commute and will give to 0 this is uh, what it means by when a hamiltonian has uh, p and r the hamiltonian contains uh, p and r and uh, this is individually how the inversion operator or the parity operator acts on each of uh, r and p and will transform them. So, uh, if uh, Hamiltonian has both r and p, so you can check whether uh, you know uh, it changes sign under uh, this inversion uh, operation. So, let me write down a few important points. So, if you consider uh, say a 2D block Hamiltonian. Just for an example, what I mean by 2D block Hamiltonian is that it is a h which is a function of k and k is a function of kx and ky, just a 2D uh, thing. And if it is um, symmetric under both inversion, which is what we have seen just now and time reversal symmetry I am in short I am writing it as uh, TRS which is T then um, the, the inversion of course uh, maps to so P i maps k to minus k k is nothing but the wave vector which is uh, related to the momentum by just multiplying it by h cross and um, it also satisfies that uh, p square is equal to 1 okay because if you do the inversion twice it comes back to the same configuration and um, then if we have trs as well uh, then uh, it uh, sort of uh, so trs does the same thing so trs also maps uh, k to minus k and um, uh, t square of course uh, will uh, square to 1 or minus 1 depending on uh, whether we have uh, the spin variable in the problem or not uh, because the spin is not included here explicitly as we can see in this block Hamiltonian then uh, we can write it as t square equal to plus 1. So, uh, if a Hamiltonian has both uh, t and p i ok. Uh, then um, h of k uh, remains as h of k I mean uh, so they will remain invariant uh, under this uh, both uh, time reversal and the inversion operation ok. So, uh, let me now look at in brief we will uh, talk about it we will talk about the particle hole symmetry. 
So uh, this means that uh, if we convert a particle into whole, um, then uh, the Hamiltonian whether the Hamiltonian remains invariant, uh, it is a property uh, of a superconductor to have a particle hole symmetry. Okay? So, the number of particle states uh, will correspond to exactly the same number of whole states and so on and uh, corresponding to a particle of energy E, particle state of energy uh, minus E, there will be a whole state of energy plus E and so on. So, uh, let us write a P P H S let let's that the operator be for the particle hole symmetry and then a Hamiltonian uh, will have uh, this kind of operation which is minus h ok. So, this is the symmetry operation of that. Uh, so, uh, we can write down this P P H S usually as a sigma x and a k where sigma x is a Pauli matrix which is written as 0, 1, 1, 0 and k is the complex conjugation operator. Okay. And as I said that uh, this is inbuilt in the in the case of uh, the superconductors. Now, uh, to wind up the discussion, uh, we will talk about the chiral symmetry. This is a very important symmetry uh, of uh, the Hamiltonian and vis a vis its relation to uh, topology. And um, in a very simple model, which we are going to uh, see just after this discussion, uh, say a model has, uh, uh, like for example, uh, graphene uh, has a chiral symmetry, which means that both the A and B sub lattice uh, they are like this. Uh, so, so it is a honeycomb lattice and uh, there are two uh, unit cells, two atoms per unit cell and um, uh, both the atoms uh, we name them as A and B, but both the atoms contain carbon. So, if A changes over to B uh, or B changes over to A, it is like an inversion about this dotted line, uh, then the Hamiltonian remains invariant because both of them correspond to carbon atoms. Okay? Uh, this is a particular example in, in graphene, but we will see more examples particularly tight binding Hamiltonians. And um, at this moment, I do not want to uh, elaborate on it much, but uh, a similar operation which we uh, do it by tau. So, this is a chiral symmetry operator. It has a similar um, effect as the particle hole symmetry. So, this is equal to minus h. Okay? So, this is the operator and these are how it sort of transforms. Um, now, uh, I am just saying that uh, chiral symmetry for a, a very simple case is uh, the inversion symmetry or it is a uh, this called as a sub lattice symmetry. So, the chiral symmetry for graphene is a sub lattice symmetry. Uh, what graphene is we have not said yet, but we will make that uh, clear as we uh, you know go along the course and, and of course, all these symmetries are uh, unitary symmetries or um, anti unitary. Uh, so, uh, this uh, gamma gamma dagger is equal to 1 and so on. Okay. So, uh, these are some of the discrete symmetries that we will be needing in uh, during the course and uh, uh, let us uh, now go into a simple problem which is a tight binding model that uh, shows topological features and uh, it is uh, the simplest paradigmatic model for uh, seeing topology and is uh, widely studied in this context. Um, it is simple and as well as it is quite um, intuitive for us to understand. Okay. So, we will uh, do that and uh, but before that let us uh, do a quick uh, recap of the tight binding uh, Hamiltonian or tight binding model. And to understand what that is, uh, it is a, a method of calculation of the energy spectrum 
uh, for a, a particle uh, that is subjected to a periodic potential and what I mean by periodic potential is that uh, we talk about crystal lattice where there are presence of uh, ions uh, or atoms at regular interval and this regular interval is called as a lattice constant okay and um, as if I consider an electron to be you know moving in this uh, array of uh, ions or atoms uh, these uh, ions say for example are going to sort of uh, exercise or uh, the electron will actually see perceive this uh, interaction uh, or rather a potential due to this presence of these uh, ions or the atoms okay and since uh, these are periodically placed one can write down uh, v equal to v of r equal to v of r plus capital r where capital r is uh, the vector that connects um, uh, from one uh, lattice point to another okay so this is the r uh, uh, this is equal to if you write so r vector is equal to a say r r cap or something okay uh, so this uh, direction is r or you can write it simply as x cap okay so uh, this is called as a periodic potential and uh, block has said that the wave function of a particle is uh, subjected to such a potential has a form which is psi k of r uh, this is equal to u k of r uh, exponential i k dot r this k is a vector. Uh, so, where is the periodicity information embedded? The periodicity um, uh, information is embedded here in this u of k which is equal to uh, u k of r equal to u k of r plus r okay. Now, this is uh, well known and uh, the proof is also uh, quite simple and straightforward we will not follow that this is the first course of solid state physics would teach you that uh, this is the uh, wave function, but uh, just getting the wave function is not enough uh, to arrive at the solution of a problem we also need to know the energies. And in order to get the energies, uh, we need to resort to some approximations. And uh, tight binding uh, approximation or tight binding model is one such approximation in which uh, it is assumed that the electronic wave function is uh, tightly bound to this uh, these ionic cores. I am just uh, for a moment I am consider them as ions so that the electron feels a potential uh, it could be an atomic potential also but let us just consider that there is a, a potential like this uh, uh, like this that is an attractive potential uh, given by these uh, ions. So, these ions are uh, positively charged and then um, it gives a potential which is uh, which is given by this. Let me uh, use a color so that uh, overwrite on this. So, this is the potential on in red that you are seeing. So, an electron that is going uh, passing through these potential. Uh, so, the electron will be passing like this and it sees a potential a series of potential which are periodically placed which means they are placed at regular intervals which are given by this A uh, which called as a lattice constant ok. So, um, uh, the assumption is that this electrons are uh, they have the majority of the amplitude of the wave function is centered at the core. Uh, ionic core that is it peaks here where the ion is and so on at all of them. It has very little overlap uh, between uh, the wave function at the next core uh, as the next ionic core. So, you see this overlap region of overlap and uh, this region of overlap is very small and uh, that is why it is called tight binding it is tightly bound to the ionic core and um, these small overlap uh, renders a mobility to the electron because the electron has to go from one um, ion to the next ion and to the next ion it will move around it is a mobile uh, charge. So, uh, it is uh, tightly bound to this and in this approximation uh, one can work out what the energy is as I said that the energy is still missing into this uh, this blocks theorem 
uh, which gives you the uh, form of the wave function. Okay. So, h is um, in this particular case h is equal to uh, say for example, a p square over 2 m which is coming from the electrons and uh, plus a v i. Okay. And uh, so, this can be written as the kinetic energy plus uh, the v i where uh, v i are these uh, ionic potentials at a site i. So, i equal to 1 to uh, n uh, whichever the number of uh, sites uh, are. Okay. And um, one can write down the wave function as psi k and it can be expanded in the basis uh, of phi alpha this is equal to c k and a phi alpha. Okay. So, this is like a expanding it in a complete set of states where phi alpha is the basis. Okay. Psi k obeys blocks theorem. So, I am trying to give you a very simple derivation of the tight binding Hamiltonian and uh, which is going to be essential for uh, a lot of the discussion that uh, is going to follow. And phi alpha of course, are the basis states. So, uh, if we uh, write down the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian, that is H alpha beta where alpha and beta are uh, two uh, orthogonal bases phi alpha H phi beta uh, we have already written H and uh, this is equal to a phi alpha uh, K plus uh, V i um, and a phi beta. Okay. And uh, this is, uh, so the kinetic energy is a one body term which we have discussed. So, this can be written as the atomic energies. Uh, so, let us write it as epsilon a t for the atomic energies and uh, what is important is this term to calculate which is equal to a i and a v i phi beta. Okay. This basic quantum mechanics. Uh, so, these epsilon a t are the on site atomic energies. Basically, because of the uh, kinetic energy of the electrons and uh, this is the thing that one needs to compute and um, it uh, one can make an ansatz as follows phi alpha sum over i v i and a phi beta. So, this is equal to v 0 for alpha equal to beta, it is equal to minus t for alpha equal to uh, beta plus or minus 1. We are uh, talking about one dimensional system and it is 0 otherwise. Okay. So, what I mean is the following that the matrix element for this v i will um, this v i will vanish if uh, these uh, i and j uh, or rather uh, these uh, alpha and beta are not uh, these wave functions that correspond to the neighboring sites. And at, at the site for alpha equal to beta that is the on site that term can be of course, uh, uh, absorbed in this uh, epsilon a t. Okay. And uh, so, if we uh, leave these epsilon a t and v 0 which we can all combine that is we can write down h alpha beta equal to some epsilon 0 delta alpha beta and then uh, we can write down a minus t. T is the uh, amplitude uh, for that matrix element for which alpha equal to either beta plus 1 or beta minus 1 where alpha and beta here refer to of course, uh, they refer to the basis indices, but the basis uh, is written in terms of the on site uh, indices, the site indices uh, for the system. So, this is equal to uh, delta alpha plus 1 
beta plus um, delta alpha minus 1 beta and so on okay so uh, and where epsilon 0 is of course this epsilon a t plus a v 0 okay that is a constant that we uh, do not need to worry about that anyway this uh, gives you the uh, diagonal elements of h alpha beta and uh, uh, minus t uh, they lie on uh, just the uh, the band above the diagonal and below the diagonal and uh, this is the form of the this Hamiltonian and the energies are uh, these are basically nothing but the energies and these energies are uh, obtained within this uh, tight binding approximation uh, as this. So, this is the uh, tight binding approximation and this is the energy corresponding to that. So, when I write down H alpha beta which means that I am writing down the uh, matrix elements of the Hamiltonian. Okay. So, uh, this uh, can be written as so your psi k uh, h psi k which gives you the energy it can be written as uh, alpha beta exponential minus i k r alpha I am writing it as a vector, but in one dimension it will be a scalar. Uh, so, phi alpha h phi beta uh, and exponential i k dot r beta. So, uh, this is nothing but equal to sum over alpha uh, epsilon 0 uh, which uh, takes into account the delta alpha beta and a minus t exponential i k a uh, where a is uh, equal to r alpha minus r beta. Uh, so, this is I am I am writing it in one dimension. So, in 1 d uh, it becomes just a. So, a is the magnitude of this okay? plus exponential minus i k a that comes from. So, this uh, alpha r alpha minus r beta and uh, if you uh, leave this term which is just a diagonal term then this becomes equal to minus 2 t cosine k a that is the tight binding dispersion for a 1 d lattice. and very soon we are going to use this. So, in 2 d square lattice uh, square lattice. So, this is a 1 d chain result and so this is like epsilon k that is uh, its dependence on this k. k is a wave vector that uh, you know runs over the first Brillouin zone and this is equal to minus 2 t uh, and then you have a cosine k x a plus a cosine k y a and so on. Okay. In a 3 d cubic lattice this can be it is a simple cubic lattice. So, epsilon k will be minus 2 t uh, cosine k x a plus cosine k y a plus cosine k z a. Okay. And uh, in, in all these cases the k uh, x y z etc uh, they run from uh, 0 to 2 pi okay um, they are sort of in this um, interval or you can call it a minus pi over uh, minus pi to plus pi okay so this is a simple tight binding model that gives you the energy of the electrons uh, in a periodic potential the wave function of the electrons uh, they have already been given by the blocks theorem okay so we are uh, more or less ready to uh, treat a, a tight binding hamiltonian um, the uh, main motive of us uh, in this particular course is uh, not to uh, look at the electronic dispersion and talk about transport properties etc. But to look at the topological uh, characters uh, from these dispersion and uh, a priori without uh, uh, doing any calculation yet uh, we can say that you know these topological properties are intimately connected to the uh, band dispersion or the spectral dispersion that is uh, these they are embedded into this epsilon k. So, if you change uh, 
the epsilon k somehow if you do some band engineering or if you change uh, uh, the uh, say you put a uh, say for example an alpha here okay where alpha uh, is uh, varies from uh, 0 to 1 uh, so this alpha and let me write it with a different color I do not intend to put it but just in case that uh, you have an, an isotropic dispersion for some reason uh, then uh, these alpha will uh, go from say 0 to 1. So, alpha is 0 to 1 and you can clearly see that if alpha equal to 0 it becomes a, a one dimensional chain and for alpha equal to 1 it becomes a regular 2D square lattice. Okay? So, any non-zero value of uh, alpha that is between 0 and 1. Uh, it will correspond to an anisotropic dispersion in which the uh, bands will be deformed if you draw the bands uh, between uh, minus pi and uh, plus pi or 0 to 2 pi uh, then the bands will be deformed. Okay. The standard way of doing this is that you take uh, a, a kx and ky. So, this is kx and ky and you uh, calculate this quantity which is minus 2t cosine kx a plus cosine ky a and then plot that in the you know the z direction uh, your epsilon k is uh, in the z direction and then when you take the projection onto the kx ky plane will give you the contours uh, or the energy dispersion and this dispersion uh, can be represented by colors which will show you know the color uh, will code values that are either higher or lower depending on uh, you know the variation of the dispersion. So, coming back to the point that um, if you change alpha or you somehow uh, deform the band structure by uh, some chemical uh, pressure or some uh, mechanical pressure or something on a lattice then the topological properties are bound to change and um, these topological invariants that we have talked about at length they also will change. Okay. So, uh, let me uh, show you one uh, very simple uh, paradigmatic model uh, which is called as a Shu Schrieffer Higer model. Okay. This is widely studied in the context of topology and it was uh, pretty uh, long back more than uh, 40 years back it was proposed uh, in a paper by Su uh, Schrieffer and Higer. Uh, Schrieffer is the same one. Uh, who is in the BCS theory of uh, superconductivity. Uh, so, this is uh, in uh, physical review letters on 18th of June 1979 and uh, the, it is about these, uh, they say that uh, these long chain uh, polyenes uh, which are polyacetylene and um, they have this form uh, C2H2N and uh, this is how a long chain polymer that is polyacetylene molecule would look like this C2H2. So, you see there is a double bond here and then there is a, a sort of single bond, there is a double bond and then there is single bond and so on and so forth. Okay? And each of the carbon is attached to a, a via single bond to a hydrogen. For us it is not important, the hydrogen is not important. For us what is important is this uh, carbon, uh, carbon, carbon bonds. So, if we forget the uh, hydrogen for the moment and only look at uh, these uh, carbon carbon chain uh, and uh, carbon is in the it has uh, carbon has uh, 1 s 2, 2 s 2, 2 p 2 um, that is a 6 electrons and then uh, these uh, one of the uh, p electrons that are available for conduction and the other p electron they uh, sort of uh, give rise to the sigma bonds which is to the stability of this uh, long chain polymer. Okay? So, uh, it is you can you can take it as uh, one electron uh, per atom and one electron per atom should be uh, a metal because uh, the electron is allowed to you know move from one carbon atom to the next and to the next and so on and will give rise to its um, conducting behavior. However, what happens is uh, that um, uh, these uh, uh, bonds are being probed uh, by NMR spectroscopy. And when they are probed, uh, they show that they have different uh, length, uh, this uh, 1.36 um, angstrom and 1.44 angstrom. 
okay so they have uh, these uh, double bonds have different length as compared to the single bonds and uh, these uh, lengths being different as a, a physics you know a person trying to find out the properties of this model one can actually say that uh, this corresponds to a hopping t1 and this corresponds to a hopping t2 just to remind you that this is the same t that we are talking about the t here which is the hopping amplitude or the amplitude of the kinetic energy for the electron to you know go from one ionic site to the next ionic site so this is the same thing here um, uh, we are talking about so there is a t1 and a t2 so this uh, model consists of uh, two atoms per unit cell two uh, carbon atoms uh, per unit cell and uh, t1 is intracell hopping and t2 is intercell hopping. Okay. Now, as it is, there is uh, no surprise in this um, model or uh, the properties do not seem to be anything uh, very different or would yield any topological feature that we are interested in, but it does. It, uh, you know, when you tune T1 with respect to T2 or T2 with respect to T1, um, you see that the system makes a transition. Uh, from a topological state to a trivial state and uh, once again I want to remind you that the topological state is like the like the donut and the trivial state is like the orange and uh, the difference between them come from the fact that one has a hole that is uh, a, a genus uh, which the uh, the donut has uh, and the orange has no such hole and that uh, it uh, denotes a trivial state of matter. So, a, whether T1 greater than T2 or T1 less than T2 will give rise to such topological state or trivial state, a, it cannot be a priori uh, you know, uh, figured out. So, that is why uh, this model is interesting. It is a model in 1D uh, tight binding chain and um, uh, that is the simplest one can think of and then we will see that uh, depending on a topological invariant called as a winding number, this model shows different properties. So, uh, uh, the discussion is like this that we will write down the Hamiltonian in the real space which we have written it down and um, then uh, of course, we will Fourier transform it and take it into momentum space, calculate the energy, plot the energy, uh, find out the topological invariant which is a winding number here, plot the winding number and see that the uh, the system winds um, the you know here it is called as an exceptional point but we have uh, introduced this as a singularity so that point of singularity whether uh, your uh, system is um, uh, it encloses or not that will decide if it does uh, then it is a topological state and if it does not it, it uh, denotes a trivial state ok. So, I uh, write down uh, so, this is the intracell hopping. So, these carbon atoms that you saw there, they correspond to A and B sub lattices. This is a C and a C a carbon atoms, uh, but since it is a 2 atoms per unit cell, uh, that is why we have labeled them as uh, 2 different uh, sub lattices. So, A and B are sub lattice degree of freedom. Okay. So, um, this is the intracell term that is uh, inside a cell from A to B sub lattice. So, N is the, the uh, unit cell index, this is the unit cell index and um, this is uh, within the cell uh, hopping of the electron from one carbon atom to another and this one is the intercell hopping okay, which comes with a T2 this one comes with a T1. So, which means that this hopping is T2 and this hopping is T1 and this is precisely we have said about that polyacetylene molecule, long chain molecule 
and this is uh, there the Hermitian conjugate this is the Hermitian conjugate is uh, always used in uh, such tight binding models and uh, uh, if you do not use the uh, plus Hermitian conjugate then uh, the Hamiltonian will come out to be or rather the energies will come out to be complex. So, there is a T1 and there is a T1 star for the Hamiltonian uh, which means that H equal to H dagger uh, your T1 uh, equal to T1 star and T2 equal to T2 star which means there Hermitian uh, these things conjugates are uh, same all right. Uh, so, you, you have no term along the diagonal because you see no term that connects uh, uh, there is no uh, potential at the as the on site potential and these are between the same unit cell this is the hopping ok between A and B sub lattices and uh, this is the hopping uh, that is between this and this is the hopping which is T2 and T2 star and so on and so forth ok. So, uh, this is written uh, in this um, uh, the first line indicates the uh, Hamiltonian uh, written on the side basis and um, in the second term we uh, wanted to make sure that you know how to write it in the basis uh, which are uh, formed by these uh, site operators. So, C1 dagger, C2 dagger, C3 dagger, Cm dagger are the um, creation operators uh, for electrons at the sites 1, 2, 3, 4 till m and similarly C1, C2 here uh, 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 they correspond to operators annihilation operators at the site C1 to Cm. Uh, there is you have to be careful if you keep m to be an even number uh, then uh, you use uh, you know the T m minus 1 is equal to T1 and uh, uh, if you take m to be an odd number then the last one uh, that is uh, or uh, the one that is uh, you know uh, one before the last last but one uh, hoppings are will change accordingly because you want to end it uh, at the uh, with the right uh, kind of hopping. All right. So, uh, because this uh, system has translational invariance uh, one can do a Fourier transform this is the uh, operator for the Fourier transform where so there is uh, n here and then there is alpha here there is n n is the uh, site index if uh, this is n uh, alpha is the sub lattice uh, index and it yields a, a when you do that apply it to this Hamiltonian equation number 1 uh, let us call it equation number 2 uh, then you get a Hamiltonian which is like this. So, if you apply 3 on uh, equation 3 on equation 1, uh, then you get this, uh, you get a nice and compact form for the C k alpha H alpha beta k C k beta where H alpha beta has a nice form which is uh, like this uh, of diagonal form uh, that is it does not have any diagonal term. Uh, 0, 0 are the diagonal elements and the off diagonal elements has a real term and an imaginary term and uh, uh, these uh, off diagonal element is actually the complex conjugate of that. So, uh, in the sense that uh, if you change uh, uh, so uh, H alpha beta k uh, is equal to H um, beta alpha you know this uh, and so on ok. I mean I can write this as H alpha beta uh, star and a transpose ok. So, this tells you that it is a Hermitian matrix and uh, so I write f of k is equal to uh, T1 plus T2 e to the power minus i k. K is uh, uh, it runs from minus pi to pi it is a one dimensional Brillouin zone. Um, you can uh, connect it you know using periodic boundary conditions, but uh, this is uh, a very simple model uh, which we are almost at the last stage of calculating the energy. But uh, as we know that calculating only the energy is not uh, sufficient, we have to also talk about the topological properties at least first calculate the energy. And um, very interestingly, uh, this Hamiltonian that we have written here uh, let us uh, call it equation 4. So, the 4 and 5 combined 
uh, you can see that we can write down uh, the Hamiltonian in terms of this called as a massless Dirac equation. And uh, why it is called a massless Dirac equation is that usually uh, the Dirac equation is written in terms of so your h is equal to uh, alpha sigma dot p uh, plus beta m naught c square that is a form of the Dirac Hamiltonian. And uh, in this particular case the uh, Hamiltonian is uh, the, this term does not arise here. Uh, and it is only this term p is nothing but uh, h cross k if you take h cross equal to 1 it is sigma dot k or k dot sigma and there is a uh, this alpha which is uh, usually it is a matrix in, in the case of Dirac equation but um, here that is equal to 1. So, it is a d dot sigma uh, so where uh, these p is replaced by d uh, and these uh, d uh, is a function of k so that is a vector there is a vector and uh, the sigma x, sigma y and sigma z are nothing but the Pauli matrices. So, in the first course of quantum mechanics you might have seen them and have read a lot about their uh, commutation relations and their properties and, and so on okay? many um, things and the problems concerning this uh, Pauli matrices uh, must have been taught. Okay. So, uh, what is this uh, d vector? d vector has got of course, three components because we are writing it as d dot sigma, but fortunately for us the uh, one component is equal to 0. That means that sigma z is not there okay? and this is a very important thing in this study of topology that uh, if you have uh, the d vector to only have two components like here x and y component, but it may have y and z component or x and z component. Uh, in that case, um, it is easy to find the winding number. If it is not the case that is if you uh, include a term say let us call it as some m sigma z and in that case you will have uh, a plus uh, there is an m here and this m will make uh, uh, the definition of the winding number to be ill defined in the sense that uh, you will not be able to show the winding uh, unless you do something to the problem that is uh, do a unitary transformation to you know um, take away one of the one of the components uh, it is very difficult to visualize the winding number. In this particular case we will uh, take this d vector and uh, vary k over the Brillouin zone which means that we change k from minus pi to plus pi and see that the 0 0 point see the 0 0 point when you have uh, k equal to uh, 0 that is I mean 0 it means that k equal to 0. So, a k equal to 0 is uh, it becomes t 1 plus t 2 and 0 0. So, the d vector becomes you know just a one component uh, thing which is just like a point. Okay? So, this uh, 0 point that is uh, the k equal to 0 which is the center of the Brillouin zone is uh, called as an exceptional point and this uh, we want to see whether the d vector encloses the exceptional point. So, this is the idea and uh, then uh, we diagonalize the 2 by 2 matrix which is very easy for us to do. So, this is the matrix that you diagonalize equation number 5 uh, f k and f star k and then uh, we find out that uh, this e k is the energy dispersion for this problem where uh, it is uh, under square root of t 1 plus t 2 cos k plus t 2 square sin square k. Uh, and there are two bands coming from the plus and the minus sign. If we open the bracket inside, we can write it in a little more uh, convenient fashion, which is you know convenient for our discussion. It is a plus minus root over of t 1 minus t 2 square plus 4 t 1 t 2 cos square k by 2. And uh, say this is uh, equation uh, 5, so this is equation 6 say this is equation 7 and let us call this as equation 8 and this is equation 9. Okay. So, um, k is as I said is contained in the, in the first Brillouin zone. So, it is uh, minus pi 
um, less than equal to k less than equal to plus pi. So, this is the form of the uh, these uh, Schuschrifer Higer model, uh, the energy dispersion of uh, particles in the Schuschrifer Higer model. Uh, it contains um, as expected uh, the two uh, hopping T1 and T2 and the k dependence is here that how it varies with k okay, and so on. Okay. So, uh, you can solve the, the matrix and find out the eigenvectors as well. We have calculated the eigenvalues and here are the eigenvectors. So, these are correspond with this plus and minus sign that you see here correspond to the plus and minus eigenvalues of this uh, Hamiltonian or these energies that you see here. And uh, so, this is a equation 10 and uh, uh, this phi k is nothing but the tan inverse of this T2 sin uh, k. Uh, so, this is nothing but a tan inverse of uh, dy by dx. Okay? That is the dy means uh, you know this is like a y component of the d vector divided by the x component of the d vector. Okay? It is not uh, derivative or anything. So, this is uh, the complete solution of the problem, uh, but we are uh, far from uh, the topology uh, that is embedded here. Now, in order to uh, see the topology, let us uh, examine few different cases. Uh, one of them is let us call it as a T2 equal to 0. That is, uh, these model does not have any uh, T2, which means that uh, these uh, intercell hopping is equal to 0. So, if you have intercell hopping equal to 0, it looks like this. So, there is nothing here. Okay? So, this is absent and this is absent and so on. And in this case, it is called as a uh, extreme dimerized limit. Uh, so, these are dimers are formed um, and uh, you have a perfect dimer and there are no free edges. So, T2 equal to 0. Now, you see, if you take the other extreme dimerized limit, which means that T1 equal to 0, that is uh, this hopping is equal to 0, if uh, that is not there, uh, then you get a form which is like this. Okay? Again, there are dimers, but there are two important uh, digressions here, which are not there in the earlier plot or earlier picture. Okay? So, there are free edges present. And why I am showing them as free edges is that now adding them to the system will not alter the energy or you take them away from the system, it will not alter the energy. And that is why these are called as 0, these will give rise to 0 modes. 0 modes means with 0 energy. Okay. Uh, they correspond to zero energy for the reason that if you take them away or put them back, uh, really does not make any difference. In a finite size chain, uh, the edges or the edge atoms, whether they are there where or whether they are not there, it uh, hardly makes a difference to, the a difference to the energy of the system, which means that they have zero energy. Okay? And this is what is important that they have uh, zero energy and um, uh, there are other cases which are uh, like this uh, T1 greater than T2 that is the intracell hopping is greater than the intercell hopping. Okay? And when they are same and when the other thing happens that is the intracell hopping is uh, smaller than the intercell hopping. Okay? Now, a priori uh, without going into the results, this case is not interesting, uh, topologically not interesting and it denotes a trivial state that is like an orange which does not have a genus. Okay? This is the critical state where uh, the uh, system undergoes from a trivial to topological by a gap closing scenario. If we, if you remember that we have talked about the Hamiltonian uh, undergoes a, you know a gap closing scenario, this gap has to close and open again uh, for the topology to be uh, visible to us or uh, it is to be perceptible, to, uh, uh, we can perceive it. So, T1 less than T2 is the topological state. 
and let us see how we understand them. If we understand them in a simple way uh, that is the triumph of this model. So, uh, the energy dispersion uh, this is a real space uh, for certain uh, you know uh, L that is we have chosen certain L is some uh, value which is say 100 or 200. So, there are these uh, say for example, 100 or 200 whatever we have uh, say 100 and then we have solved it uh, with uh, T 2 uh, with T 1 equal to 1. Okay. So, T 1 equal to 1 you see that there is a 0 mode that is visible let me use a color there is a 0 mode that is visible here. So, that is beyond 1 that is T 2 greater than 1 you see there is a 0 mode and uh, there is no 0 mode prior to that and uh, uh, the this is the bulk of the system. Bulk means all the states that are in between. So, this is Okay. say this is equal to 100. Okay. So, this is the last one. So, from uh, T2 equal to 1 and above, so that is T2 greater than 1, these two becomes like this case, like this case, okay. where there are these free edges and they, there are 0 modes present in the system. So, there are 0 modes. Bulk has a gap in both the cases that is the bulk states that is these states these are bulk okay? and this is edge the left edge and this is the right edge. Okay? So, these are the bulk states which are here and here. So, the system is topological here. So, okay, because the zero modes exist, because you can add two edge modes which are uh, so it does not matter to the system whether you have added them or you have deleted them they are the modes with zero energy. Now, you see that uh, before uh, these T 2 equal to 1 or larger we just talk about because T 2 equal to 1 is a critical state that is the gap closing thing which you see here. So, we will talk about T 2 greater than 1. So, T 2 less than 1 you see that there is a gap here at all values the gap is of course, uh, reducing but th there is a gap, but there is no 0 mode. So, th there is the trivial region. This region acts like an orange which has no genus okay? and the, the 0 modes uh, come from T 2 greater than T uh, 1 that is T 2 greater than T 1 because T 1 we have taken to be equal to 1. If we take T 1 equal to 2 it will happen at T 1 greater than 2. So, uh, why is it topological? Because now there is a difference between the edge and the bulk okay? and this is the precisely the distinction of topological insulator. So, in the bulk of the system it looks different than what it looks at the edges okay? and that is uh, what is apparent from here. Uh, it will be more apparent if we calculate the topological invariant. Uh, we calculate the uh, psi i squared here as a function of the site index, uh, site indices and you see that only at the edges we just plot the edges in this left hand side. So, this is the edge probability and this is the bulk. So, the bulk is extended it like, like a metallic uh, bulk okay? or they are extended states and so on and th these are seem to be uh, sort of there are high weights here whereas, the, uh, the bulk states have almost same weight everywhere. Okay? It is uh, there is a 10 to the power minus 3 which means that it is a very small weight uh, for all the bulk states whereas, at the edges it is almost equal to 1 which means that bulk and edge they behave differently and this is called as a bulk edge correspondence. So, we will calculate the topological property from the bulk properties, but it will show uh, signatures of the edge modes being present and that is called as a bulk 
uh, age correspondence or the bulk boundary correspondence. Okay. Anyway, so uh, we calculate this winding number. Uh, it looks a little complicated. We'll sort of simplify this discussion. Uh, so uh, mathematically, the winding number, which is a topological invariant. Okay. So this is the topological invariant. And it is some uh, d cap cross d d k of uh, this thing. So, this d d k of this d and then you take the z component and then d unit vector d is uh, the vector d we have talked about and then magnitude of d. Okay. Uh, so, this is a more useful form and that can be used uh, easily. Uh, you remember that we have defined f of k, f of k was defined here. Yes, this is f of k. You take f of k and take this, you take the log of that, take a ddk of that and then integrate over the Brillouin zone which is from minus pi to plus pi. Okay? Uh, this uh, everywhere we have taken a to be equal to 1 where a is the uh, nearest neighbor carbon carbon distance or the lattice spacing. So, this is if you take this and then log of f k you write it as this and do a little bit of algebra this will give you the uh, winding number to be 1 or 0 depending upon uh, the exceptional point or the singular point is being wound or not okay whether the system winds this thing okay so we uh, show all these uh, uh, five situations that we have talked about here uh, like the ones that are talked about so these two dimerized limit one being a uh, trivial topological topological um, and uh, again this is trivial critical and topological and so on so we uh, calculate this winding number that we have just defined by this and calculate it for each one of these things. Of course, this is uh, the dimerized limit where we do not uh, expect any topological properties uh, which is this extreme dimerized limit the top one that we see here this one that we see here uh, that uh, corresponds to this winding. So, uh, we plot both the energy and uh, the winding number. So, energy is on the left panel and the winding number is on the right panel uh, for the same values of these things. So, this t1 equal to 1, t2 equal to 0, you see two flat bands at 1 and plus 1 and minus 1 and you see that uh, there is no winding uh, of the uh, d in the dy dx plane as you change k from uh, minus pi to plus pi. Okay? As you uh, see the second scenario that is uh, you have uh, T1 still greater than T2 which means it is a trivial phase and the bands of course show some dispersion not like this flat ones that you see here it shows some dispersion but you see the winding this dx dy plane encloses a, a red circle which does not uh, include the origin which is here. So, this is of course a trivial phase and by these blue arrows what we uh, show is that uh, the d vector the unit vector uh, d at, at various points in the uh, dx dy plane as you change k okay uh, that is shown by this blue arrow here okay. So, the winding is actually 0 winding is a point there is no winding here uh, this is the d vector that is being shown. Okay. And here also it is a trivial, uh, this is the critical okay. and I said that the critical will show a gap closing scenario. You see at the uh, corner of the Brillouin zone which are minus pi and plus pi, you see that the gaps close. Okay. Gaps close, the dx dy circle just touches the touches the singular point or the exceptional point which is k equal to 0. So, this is the k equal to 0 point and it does not enclose it. Okay? And again these uh, dx dy directions are shown like this. This will correspond to topological phase. Now, if you look at the band structure between this and this that is t1 equal to 1, t2 equal to 0.5. Uh, t1 greater than t2, the band structure is absolutely identical. 
Okay. So, the conduction band which is shown by red and the valence band which is shown by blue, uh, these correspond to the plus and minus signs of the E versus K. Uh, they are different, but of course, you see the dx dy uh, curve which is a closed curve in the dx dy plane as you change k from minus pi to plus pi encloses the origin. Okay? And that is why the winding is equal to plus 1 or, or it is finite okay? and it is not 0. That is what is shown here that you see that the winding is 1 or 0. So, 1 corresponds to topological like your donut or your mug, 0 corresponds to trivial like an orange with no genus. Okay. So, even though the band structure does not say anything that is E versus K, uh, we have done it with K A just to take it dimensionless so that it becomes a number, but the winding of this uh, gives you that it winds the origin. Okay. And uh, this is the other dimerized limit where there are uh, you know T 2 is greater than T 1 um, or rather uh, this is like uh, T2 uh, is equal to 1 and T1 equal to 0. Uh, that is the case which we have shown graphically by this plot, this one here. Okay? That is shown by this. Okay? Now, you see it is again topological for the reason that your dx dy plane, the curve, the closed curve actually encloses the origin. Okay? And uh, so, this of course, shows a topological phase transition uh, as the system you know goes from, from this uh, dimerization. So, uh, we call a dimerization to be a ratio which is like T 2 by T 1. So, if uh, T 2 by T 1 if T 2 is greater than T 1 or this dimerization is greater than 1. So, dimerization is greater than 1 then topological or uh, let us not call it dimerization. Let us call it as uh, you know uh, basically this is T 2 by T 1. Okay? And uh, let us not I mean it is a dimerized model of course. So, let us not call, talk about this as dimerization, but you can call it a hopping anisotropy, anisotropy parameter or something. Okay? So, this anisotropy, so this will be topological and this to be trivial, critical and to be trivial. Okay. So, SSH model thus encodes a very important property uh, which is very important for our discussion. It is a very simple model. Uh, however, it shows uh, the topological characters uh, uh, that we have talked about. It shows a topological phase transition uh, as these, uh, these hopping uh, amplitudes, the ratio of the hopping amplitudes are varied uh, across the value uh, 1. Okay. So, uh, we will uh, uh, come back with another model, uh, slightly more uh, difficult, but nevertheless an important model which also shows topology. Okay. We will stop here. Thank you.